So what does Minority Report, Black Mirror, and 1984 all have in common? Now, it's not the fact that they're all forms of media, you know, books, films, TV shows, nor is it the fact that they're all about dystopian futures. Instead, it's the fact that they each talk about predicting crime in one form or another. Whether that's the precogs in Minority Report, the recaller in Black Mirror, or the Fort Police in 1984, each of these forms of media look at how we could predict crime, but more specifically, the repercussions of doing so. And that's what we're going to be talking about today. We're going to be talking about how we can use natural language processing, a form of machine learning, to help us predict crime. And hopefully, by the end of today, we should have answered this question. The question of can we predict crime? So let's jump straight into it. What is predictive policing? I keep talking about it, but what actually is it? Because if we're going to use natural language processing to predict crime, then we kind of need to know what predictive policing is in the first place. And predictive policing comes down to two main areas, location-based predictive policing and individual-based predictive policing. Now, as the name may suggest, location-based predictive policing is all about looking at an area. It's about saying, in this area, in the future, is a crime likely to occur? Now, this is a map of London between a specific time period where the colors show where and when crime has occurred. And data like this is really useful for location-based predictive policing because we can use this data and we can say, okay, if a crime has occurred under the focusing on individual-based predictive policing, the idea of looking at an individual and saying, how likely is this specific individual to commit a crime? And when it comes to individual-based predictive policing, there's an array of approaches, theories, and methodologies that we can use to help us predict crime. And I'm going to be focusing on three of these today. The first theory that we're going to look at is called strain theory. Now, strain theory is the idea that society puts pressure on individuals to achieve specific goals, like the American dream. But when individuals lack the means to achieve those goals, they're more likely to commit crime so that they can achieve them. Next, we're going to look at social control theory. Now, what this theory states is it says that individuals who lack close relationships, commitments, values, or norms, again, are more likely to commit crime because they don't have those relationships or values as an anchor in society. And then finally, we're going to look at social disorganization theory. Now, what this theory states is it says that location is key. If someone lives or works in an area known for a specific type of crime, this theory states that intrinsically, by just being there, you're more likely to commit crime. So, so far, we've looked at what predictive policing is, different types of predictive policing, and how we can use predictive policing approaches to predict crime. But this talk is all about natural language processing. It's all about how we can use machine learning to automate this whole process. But before we dive into natural language processing, we need to understand what language is in the first place. And for us, as human beings, language comes down to these three main areas, speaking, reading, and writing, things that we all do every day. So because we do these things every day, most of us, or maybe some of us, will be able to answer this next question. And that's the question of Paris minus France plus England equals what? Now, the answer is London, because Paris is to France as London is to England. Now, if we knew that that was the answer, great. But why did we know that that was the answer? Well, we would have known that that was the answer because of the experiences we've had. We've read books, gone on the internet, spoken to people. And that's all built on our understanding and our knowledge base of the world. And so, if we were to give that question to our natural language processing machine, would it be able to answer it? Well, yes, but only if we gave it that right knowledge base. So this is the Wikipedia article for London. 
And if we fed this into our natural language processing machine, it would learn from that surrounding context. It would learn that London is a city, that London is in the UK, of which England is as well. Building on that knowledge base and building on that understanding. And so if that's how natural language processing works, how does sentiment analysis work? Because sentiment analysis is a form of natural language processing that allows our natural language processing tool to look at a specific piece of text and to say, what is the emotion? What is the sentiment behind that text? And again, for us as human beings, we have eight main pillars to our emotions. But for sentiment analysis, we only really care about two. That's positive emotions and negative emotions. So how do we translate these eight down to two? Well, when we're talking about positive emotions, we're really talking about these ones in green, joy, trust, things along those lines. And when we're talking about negative emotions, we're talking about these ones in red, sadness, emotions along those lines. And so if that's how sentiment analysis works, if that's how natural language processing works, what already exists? What are some examples of natural language processing in the real world? Well, this is AWS Comprehend, or specifically Comprehend Medical, which is Amazon's approach to natural language processing when it comes to medicine and healthcare. A doctor or healthcare professional will type in a patient's details, symptoms, information. The natural language processing tool will go off, do its thing, and it will come back with key bits of information it thinks that healthcare professional needs to know. Next, we have Tay.ai. Now, Tay.ai was Microsoft's approach to natural language processing when it came to a Twitter chatbot. Tay would tailor its response to people depending on how people spoke to it. Now, it was quite controversial. It lasted just under 24 hours, but nonetheless, is a great example. And then finally, we have predictive text. So whether or not you're on an Android or an iPhone, the way that predictive text most probably works on your device is by using natural language processing. So there we have three great examples. We have healthcare, communications, mobile phones. But none of those examples look at how we could use natural language processing to predict crime, which is why this talk exists. So how might we do that? Well, this is Alice, and it's Alice's job to do just that. It's Alice's job to predict crime. The way that Alice currently does this is she individually and manually goes to different websites, different chat forums, different social media accounts, and she profiles specific individuals on their likelihood of committing crime. And the problem with this is that it's slow and laborious. So how can we take this to the next level? Well, we can automate it. We can go to these websites, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, Tumblr. We can download information relating to specific users, maybe tweets, posts, comments. We can use natural language processing on that text. And then we refer back to those predictive policing approaches that we mentioned earlier. First of all, we look at that text. And we say, does that text contain reference to any goals or aspirations? And if so, what is the sentiment? Next, we take that same bit of text, but now we say, does that text contain reference to any close relationships, any individuals, any groups, any organizations? And if so, what is the sentiment? And then finally, we take that same bit of text, but now we say, does that text contain reference to the individual's location? If so, is it a location known for this type of crime? And then finally, what is the sentiment? We then go through each of these layers, aggregating a score as we go. And again, that score defines the overall likelihood of this specific individual committing a crime. And there we have it. We've looked at what predictive policing is, we've looked at what natural language processing is, and we've also looked at how we can merge these two ideas together, how we can use natural language processing to predict crime. And with that, we've answered that original question. That question of can we predict crime? And the answer is yes, at least in part anyway. But by answering that question, we uncover a second question. And that's the question of should we? Should we predict crime? Because with predictive policing comes biases, comes segregation, 
comes in the not understanding of how this data is or should be used. And I don't want to end this talk on a somber note. I don't want to say that we're going to end up in the dystopian futures of Minority Report, Black Mirror, or 1984. Instead, I want to say that it's up to us. It's up to us to forge and to mold how predictive policing is used in the real world. It's up to us to understand its strengths, but it's also up to us to understand its disadvantages. And then finally, it's up to us to make sure that we don't end up in those dystopian futures. Thanks, everyone.